Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and go to the 127th Psalm, Psalm 127. Just five verses here in Psalm 127, and uh, it's not a long psalm, and I think we'll just read it together in unison this evening. Psalm 127. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 1, and we'll read all five verses together. Ready? Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Father, we ask you to add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. Lord, once again, we thank you, Lord, for the good service tonight enjoyed the music and the, the choir special, enjoyed the testimonies of your people giving praise to you, of your goodness and your blessing to us and your working in our lives. And Lord, thank you for what you do in us and what we continue to ask you to do through us. Lord, we pray now that you'll uh, prepare us for the message this evening from your word. Be with Brother Bob as he gives us a special tonight. Help us to listen carefully. And Lord, tune our heart to your heart, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Though dark be the night and long be the day, Lord, make me follow in thy perfect way. Though calm is sorrow, though great be my pain, Lord, make me serve thee, come sunshine or rain. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord, for the Lord, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. O thou art almighty, I am so small, Lord, make me trust thee, whatever befall. Thou art a holy, you make no mistake, Lord, make me Christ-like, whatever it takes. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord, for the Lord, Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word once again. As has been testified tonight, Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you, Lord, that not only have you inspired your word by men of old, but you have preserved your word and kept it for us. We hold copies in our hands tonight. Lord, I pray that each of us would 
listen carefully this evening and receive from you that which you would have for us. Give us all ears to hear what the Spirit would say to His church this evening. Help me as I bring this message and help each individual as they listen. May your will be done in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, Amen. Psalm 127 is a psalm of David to his son Solomon. God has told David that he will not be able to build the temple that he desires to build for God. Uh, He says, I will raise up a seed to you, your son, and he will be the one that will build the temple for me, to build a house for me. And, And he's always giving advice here in Psalm 127 to Solomon about building that temple and building a house for God. And I think we can look at it in, that's the historical context, and obviously we can look at it on an application level that uh, that's for those of us who aren't necessarily building a physical structure, but we're building a life. And uh, all of us have the foundation, if we know Christ is our Savior, that He is the foundation. And 1 Corinthians reminds us that all of us have to take heed how we build thereon. And so all of us are building. It's a matter of uh, how are we building and uh, what kind of materials are we using. And here he opens up in verse 1 by reminding Solomon that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. He's giving him advice now about when he gets ready to build the temple. He said, Solomon, it's going to be vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he giveth his beloved sleep. And as you go through this psalm tonight, I just want to uh, kind of point out three words for us, okay, uh, that we're going to focus on. I won't be long this evening uh, for you, and, uh, but I do think there's some things here that will help us if we give our attention to them this evening. Three words. The first word is build. Build. Notice, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So you notice Solomon, he's saying to Solomon, he says to us, it's not the labor, but it is the Lord. It's always the Lord first and labor second. You understand, they've got to keep those in the proper order. And it's the Lord that builds It's not the Lord that helps build. He's not helping you here, Solomon. He didn't say except the Lord helps you build the house. He said except the Lord what? Build the house. And so God has to do the building. There's a difference between asking for Him to help you do it and saying, God, you do it. (laughs) And you build it. Okay? And uh, I'll, I'll be able to help you. You see, without Him... We can do nothing. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. Oh, it doesn't mean we wouldn't labor. It just means it would be in vain. It would be empty. Vain means nothing. Vanity. Emptiness. And it doesn't amount to anything. But with Christ, all things are possible. Alright? So God must build the house. And God must build a life. You're not going to build your life on your own. You're not going to uh, say, well, I'll pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Uh, that's, that's not the way you build a life that lasts and to build a life that impacts others for Christ. Uh, God must build your life. God must build the family. God must build the church. It's, it's Jesus said that this is my church and upon this rock I will build my church. We don't have to worry about building a church. Jesus promised He'd do that. And we just have to stay out of the way uh, and not hinder Him from doing that, alright? And so, uh, the, the question you, you say tonight is, or you ask yourself tonight is, do, do I seek God to build my life? Do I seek God to build my family? Do I seek God to build my marriage? Do I seek God to help me rear my children? Do I seek God to build our church. You see, we have to be seeking God to build. It's vain to rise up early and to stay up late. Somebody says, well, to be a success, 
You got to get up there before anybody else is up and stay up later and anybody else stays up and you know, you got to burn the candle at both ends. Well, that's if you want to do it without God. Nothing wrong with getting up early. Nothing wrong with getting after it. Nothing wrong uh, with the labor. But you're not going to obtain, you're not going to build by trying harder. That's not the issue and that's not the way to get it done. You, you don't... You don't ever get anywhere by trying harder in the Christian life. You get there by trusting more. And your faith and your trust in God grows. And that's how you obtain what God wants, it, wants you to do. And you know what? When you leave it in God, God's hands, you can go to sleep at night. When you leave it in God's hands, it says, he, he, listen, He said, so He giveth His beloved sleep. I know some of you, that's your life's verse. But... He gives His beloved sleep. And, and you can rest. You can go to sleep at night. You don't have to have a pill to go to sleep. Is this on? Come on. Does, you don't have to... Hey, He didn't say you, you leave it in the hands of the psychiatrist or leave it in the hands of the therapist. Leave it in God's hands. You know, He's got better hands than all state. Okay? And, and so you can rest, you can rest, you can sleep. Why? It's in God's hands. It's not in my hands. And so He gives His beloved sleep. Don't answer out loud, but just ask yourself this question. How do I sleep? How do you sleep? And then ask yourself the question, well, is the Lord building? Or am I building? Is the Lord, have I let the Lord be the supervisor and is He in control of the building or am I in control of the building? So He giveth His beloved sleep. Daniel was arrested and convicted of praying to someone other than the king, asking a petition of someone other than the king. The punishment would be thrown into a den of lions. And Daniel passed the night fretting and worrying and being upset. Wondering, figuring out how he can keep the lions away from him. How can I distract them? How can I keep them from eating me up? No, I think he laid one of them, I think he laid down and he used one of them for a pillow. I don't think Daniel had any worries at all. Peter, they arrest Peter. By the way, you read the book of Acts in chapter 12. They took James and what, remember, remember what happened to James? They cut his head off. And then they proceeded to arrest Peter and they were intending after Easter to cut his head off. Acts chapter 12. And while, he, while that night in prison, they're having a prayer meeting at John Mark's mother's house. They're praying for Peter. For God to deliver him out of prison. And so God dispatches the angel to go get Peter out of prison. But when the angel gets there to where Peter is, well, Peter's praying along with those people at the prayer meeting, right? No. What was Peter doing? He was sleeping. The angel had to wake him up. The angel had to give him a kick in the side. Come on, man. Get up. Wake up. And even when he was started going out through the gates, you know what Peter thought he was doing? He thought he was dreaming. You say, man, if you were, let me ask you a question. If you were destined to go to the chopping block, would you be sleeping? Would you be able to rest? The only way you can do that is if it's the Lord that builds the house. If the Lord is in control and the Lord is in charge, He gives His beloved sleep. And you can rest in Him. God builds His church. I think my wife would testify that in, in the 36 years of being in the ministry that I've never laid awake at night worrying. She cannot testify to that, but I can testify to that. Uh, I, I've... God has always allowed me to sleep. And, and, and you know what? It's, it's, his, it's His church. It's not mine. 
He builds the church. Now, it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that we don't labor. We labor. Be therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we labor, but by the way, why do we labor and how can we labor? Because it's God that works in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The very fact I want to labor for God doesn't come from Satan. And it doesn't come from the flesh, it comes from God. And so God gives us that desire and that ability to labor. But listen, it doesn't depend on me. It depends on God. And I leave the results to Him. Do you allow God to build your life? Do you allow God to build your home? Will we continue to let God build His church? That's why we, we've had discussions, you know. You, uh, I think somebody asked me 13 years ago. We had one of the nights we were here candidating and preaching. They had a question and answer time. Do you remember that? I think, I think I stood right down here, and of course we had pews in those days, remember? And people asked me questions. I remember Brother Wallace, somebody asked me, what are your plans, I think, what are your plans to grow the church? <laughs> well, you know what you're going to do? You're going to preach the gospel, you're going to lift up Jesus Christ, you're going to try to win people to Christ. God will build the church. Said, well, what's your ten year plan? I don't have a ten year plan. Said, did you en did you envision this thirteen years ago? No. I, I didn't all because I'm not in charge. God's in charge. I don't know what God has in store for the next thirteen years. I have no idea. If you believe you'd have, if you'd have told me thirteen years ago, if you'd have told the people in this room that night, Wallace's were here, Anderson's were here. Who else was here? Carol Hoskins might have been here. Did you go to church on Sunday nights back then? No, I'm kidding. And uh, if you just said, hey, in 13 years we'll have uh, ministry in, you know, uh, what, four different prisons and we'll um, be on the radio and we'll support 71 missionaries around the world, they probably would have said, man, what are you, you know, <laughs> what are you smoking? You know what I mean? They said, what's wrong with you? Uh, you wouldn't have believed that. Because none, none of us would have thought of that or fathomed that. You know why? Because we're not building it. God is. So we just wait and see what, what, what God has in store next. And when we see what God's doing, we roll up our sleeves and we go to work. Build. Build. The second word I want you to notice is the word keep. The Bible says here in verse 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it, yet... Verse, also verse 1, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. You know what's great about God? He doesn't just build it, He keeps it. He, he watches over it. He keeps the city. And can I say this? I believe the, the city isn't kept unless the homes are kept. Godless homes produce godless citizens. Are, are, are we not seeing that in our society? The problem isn't the, the people throwing temper tantrums because their guy didn't get elected or their guy didn't get in the office or their guy didn't get an appointment uh, or they, they, someone else disagrees with them. The, the, the issue is they never they, they threw tantrums at home before they ever threw them out in the street. And nobody ever did anything about it. The Lord is our keeper. Several scriptures to look at. Put, your, put a paper or finger there in Psalm 127. Let's look at a couple scriptures in the New Testament. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We talked about this briefly when we were in 2 Timothy on Wednesday night. 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. Where, of course, you know that Paul said, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. See, that's the, the problem. You say, oh, that, like Brother Leland says, oh, I, I, I disagree with Brother Slayball. He believes once saved, always saved. No, uh, Brother Slayball believes the Bible. And the Bible teaches once saved, always saved. You can say, well, uh, this verse over here, 
you never take an obscure verse in the Bible and make it disprove all the plain verses in the Bible. There are enough plain verses in the Bible that tell me that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. Now, is He able to keep or is He not able to keep? So He's able to keep unless I don't want Him to keep it. But am I bigger than God? Am I stronger than God? Did I do anything to earn my salvation? I cannot do anything to unearn my salvation. I cannot do anything to lose it. I didn't do anything to get it. I received it as a gift from God. And God's not an Indian giver. Amen? Amen. Jude 24. Jude 24. Jude is right before Revelation. little tiny book for Revelation. We just say Jude 24 because there's only one chapter in Jude. Okay, so it's the 24th verse of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. If God doesn't keep us, then Paul didn't know about it. And if God doesn't keep us, then Jude didn't know about it either. 1 Peter chapter 1. Go back to your left, right before the 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, you have 2 Peter. Then 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice with me verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the, from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept. Who are what? Kept. Kept by our power. Oh no, that's, that, you, if that says, you got the wrong Bible if it says that, okay? Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. How are you kept? By the power of God. How are you kept? By the power of God. It's not my power. It's not my living. It's not what I do. It's, it's by God's power. Notice, it says, back in Psalm 127, it says, Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. There's always a watchman there that would watch the city and watch for any incoming or, or enemy enemies that might want to attack. And he would give the warning to the city to be prepared and get ready for battle. And he said, so we, we can watch. And the Lord several times told His disciples to watch. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. So be on the watch and be looking. And, but I watch, but He keeps. I watch for the danger but He keeps. Now parents and mom and moms and dad and, and adults, we have to be on the watch. Can I help you mom and dad? Rearing children today is, is, is more difficult than it was 50 years ago. You, you read sometimes about some of the problems. You've seen those lists before. I've seen them. Uh, you know, the biggest problems in school in 1940s or 1950s. And you know, it's chewing gum and you know, doing some other just, just silly stuff, shooting spit wads or something, compared to the problems they got today in school. And, and teen pregnancy has increased 500% in the last 30 years. Suicide among young people has increased 300%. In many homes, both parents are working. Fathers are absent or just too busy. TVs and electronic devices are raising another generation. And a lack of discipline is evident everywhere. We're seeing it. That generation, the, the, the Spock generation that says you shouldn't discipline your child or you shouldn't ever spank your child, well, those kids have grown up. How do we like the product? You know, it just amazes me that nobody says, you know what, maybe we need to go back and change some things. We don't like what we're getting here. We have to be watching, mom and dad. Be, be, be vigilant about that. I was, 
I have down here the public school is failing. I, it, you have to understand something. It's, it's not a public school anymore. It's a state school. They're teaching you tolerance and relativism. One of the top officials of the National Education Association said recently, if children come to school with different values than those that are taught at school, teachers should encourage the students to discard the lessons that their parents are teaching. They call for diversity and tolerance. We know they're rewriting the history books to be politically correct rather than truthful. They seek to remove God from the school completely. They no longer teach America's spiritual heritage. Evolution is taught as fact and creation in many cases is not even mentioned. You better be vigilant if your child's in a state-run school. You better be watchful. You better be on guard. Entertainment. The programs on television and pumping the idea of premarital sex and alcohol and music and movies that are full of profanity and revenge and lewd scenes. And we're letting it go. In some cases, we just turn like it's not even there. Hollywood Hollywood will ruin your children. Hollywood will ruin your children. I shared. I might as well put this out to you. Friday at a, the RU meeting at Madison, Friday morning. Samuel Alpha Dhabi. I don't know what country Samuel's from, somewhere in Africa. He's a, he started out our group, our second talk. Raised his hand. He said, I have a question. I said, okay, Samuel. He said, uh, coming from our country here to America, he said, I was surprised and I didn't understand why your churches are celebrate Halloween. He was just floored. They understand the demonic connotation that it comes from in their country. And they come here and they didn't understand why churches had Halloween decorations in church. And were participating in that activity. He said, why is that? Here's a man new to America, coming to America, and wants to know what, what's going on with American churches. Now, I said, you want the short answer or the long answer? I said, the short answer is why are churches celebrating that? The short answer is, I have no idea. Because it has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with Christianity. Oh, that's popular. Witches and goblins and ghosts and incantations and all that goes along with it. Gore and... What, what, Mom and Dad, be careful. Watch. Watch. We have a society in America that has such few values and morality. Homosexuality and lesbianism being promoted as normal. Unborn children are slaughtered by the millions. Mom and Dad, it, it isn't the school's responsibility. It isn't the church's responsibility. It is your responsibility to bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You have that responsibility. And so you have to watch. God can keep them. And God will do His job. But we're to watch. And be on guard. Not allow things into our home that ought not to be there. So we look at build. We look at keep. 
The third word I want you to see is blessing. Blessing as a word isn't there, but it's, it speaks of it in, chapter, in verse 3. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. The blessing are the children. One child was in school and the teacher said, now I want you to use the word gruesome in a sentence. The little boy raised his hand. He said, okay. My daddy shaved, but then he grew some whiskers. <laughs> you got to like children. Here the Bible says, they're a heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is His reward. It's a blessing. To have children. I don't know if you've seen the statistics of the different countries in Europe that are being overrun by Muslims. And they're doing it because they're having children at an 8 to 1 ratio. And most of Europe... It, it, you have to have at least a two child to one parent relationship, two to one, in order to maintain your society. Most of them are below that mark. And so they know, the Muslim knows, it's just a matter of time till we'll take over. We'll be the majority. And America is right on that precipice. Don't listen to the world when it comes to whether you ought to have children. Children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. Now, let me make sure you understand something. If you're unable to have a child, it doesn't mean that's God's punishment. It doesn't say that. It says the fruit of the womb is His reward. It's His blessing to you. So don't look at, don't look at those kids. Oh, these kids, what am I going to do with them? You're going to let them be a blessing to you is what you're going to do. They're a blessing from God. Better than silver and gold. Better than fame. Children. I'll contend you'll get more blessing, more joy, more satisfaction, more contentment from your children than you will any of your possessions. There are, there are people I've dealt with through the years, and listen, they, they have everything you'd want to live with. They've got the beautiful home and they've got the, 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 all the toys and the luxuries and the, the position and the money and they've got everything you think they would want to have to have a wonderful life, but they're not happy. They're burdened and they're broken. Why? Because their children are not living for God. They'd trade it all to have children that love God. I have no greater joy, the Bible says, than to hear that my children walk in truth. The Bible says you ought to have your quiver full of them. Brother, got to have lunch today with Brother Philemon and Elena and their family. I can say whatever I want because Elena won't know what I've said. But, uh, She's smiling. She must know what I said. Philemon, and now, now they have five children. I said, is there going to be a six and a seven and an eight? He said, yeah. <laughs> Probably eight. Now, I didn't ask Alina what she thought about that, but I did ask Philemon. I said, fill the quiver up. Amen. Because the Bible says here, notice what it says. Has, verse 4, as arrows are, in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. As arrows, they're able to go further and do more than we could ever do by ourselves. Children.
children can be a tremendous weapon that we use to fight the enemy. They're arrows. Now, an arrow has to be straight. An arrow has to be sharp. An arrow has to be directed. And all those things are true of children. Train them up in the way that they should go. You have to give them direction. But well trained and sharp and straightened, they'll shoot and hurt the enemy. That's what we're supposed to do. Well trained, sharpened in aim, they will hurt the enemy. If they're not trained, they're not sharpened and they're not aimed, mark it down, they will hurt the parents. I'm told archers will spend countless hours preparing their arrows. They choose carefully the right piece of wood. They cut it precisely to size. Then they spend hours polishing, shaping, fitting the feathers and the arrowhead. Then they carefully aim their arrows because an errant arrow can do great harm. I read a statement this week that was written over a hundred years ago. And it said this, Parents must not trifle with their children like idiots playing with sharp tools. Wow. Don't get mad at me. I didn't say it. I just read it. But I agree with it. Too many parents trifle with their children and wonder why they didn't turn out very well. What's your aim for your children? Most, most Christian parents play defense, not offense. Playing defense means this. Well, I hope they won't smoke, they won't drink, they won't do drugs, they won't sleep around, hope they won't get in trouble. That's, that's the philosophy of many, many parents. Can I help you with something? That's way too low of a goal. I want to raise, raise your children to, to, to have an impact for Christ. To do something with their life for God. Don't dream small dreams for your children. Don't you think, well, I hope they go to college or get an education, find a career, settle down, marry a good person, move out of the house. <laughs> do you want your children to serve God? Do you want your children to impact a world for Jesus Christ? It won't happen by accident. You have to sharpen them. Point them in the right direction. Aim them in the right direction. And they'll be a great source of happiness to you. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Now, the Bible doesn't say what size the quiver is. There are different sizes of quivers. If you're Anderson quiver, it takes 12. <laughs> but someone else's quiver may be full at 4. <laughs> I thought for sure that would come from Tanya. But uh, that's good, Bob. <laughs> you, 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 you second that, huh? More children, more prayers. More children, more happiness. More arrows, the more secure you are. Look at a verse of Scripture with me in the book of Genesis, will you please? We'll be done. Genesis 24. Genesis 24. In Genesis 24... The servant of Abraham has sent to get a wife for Isaac. And of course, if you remember, they, her parents wanted them to stay for a day or two. They kind of were delaying things, kind of holding on to Rebecca as long as they could. Finally, in Genesis 24, 
Verse 56, notice what the servant says. He said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I might go to my master. And they said, Well, we'll call the damsel and inquire to her mouth. They called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. Now watch verse 60. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. You know what they were saying? They were saying, you be much more successful than we ever were. May God bless and use you in a greater way than He ever did us. And God did. Through His promise to Isaac, to Abraham, and to Jacob. They'll win victories, you won't. That's why chapter, verse 5 of Psalm 127 said that they will not be ashamed, they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. That was a place of authority in the city. Your children can rise and do things in a much greater way than you or I ever could. Whether your children are a blessing or a burden is up to you. It's up to you. Mothers, listen carefully. Your greatest contribution to the work of God and the cause of Christ will not be what you do, but someone you raise. Your greatest contribution to the cause of Christ will not be something you do, but someone you raise. Someone you train and raise for the glory of God. The Lord Jesus is the head of the church. Any growth, any blessing, any advances, any expansion of ministry ultimately comes from Him. I was looking back at the history of Bible Baptist Church. I'm the seventh pastor this church has had. That's pretty good for 63 years. Every pastor who came before me made his contribution to Bible Baptist Church. And for such a time as this, I make my contribution. But if the Lord tarries His coming... I'll be replaced by someone else who will serve the Lord and make His contribution. See, pastors come and pastors go, but the church moves on because it's God's church. It's the Lord's church. And as long as the Lord is alive and well, the church will be alive and well because He builds the church. Now, I hope you're happy this evening because I'm happy being your pastor. I know that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. I think people come up with these things just to sell cards. But it ought to be, it ought to be and they don't have that, but I'm sure if, if, if enough people say it, they'll come up with it. It ought to be a congregation appreciation. Because the truth is, Hey, I can, I can say, hey, let's go this way all we want, but if you don't follow, we don't get anything done. Husbands, you can do all you want, but if your wife just says, no way, Jose, even if you're not Jose, <laughs> it isn't going to work. You've got to have followers. For all the problems in our society and the problems we face in our country, I think it's a great time to be alive. I think it's a great time to serve God. I think we have awesome opportunities and incredible open doors of ministry available to us. I'm excited about the future. I think when we look back at what God has done in 13 years from just uh, on that Sunday night when I think it was 15 people voted us in to be the pastor at Bible Baptist Church. And we look back over what God has done in 13 years. 
if, if anybody ought to be rejoicing, it ought to be us. And thank God for His goodness and the prayers He's answered. The people that He's reached, the lives that have been touched because of Bible Baptist Church. Let's, let's keep moving forward. I say we, 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 it's just beginning to see what God can do. Let's be yielded to Him. Oh, let's labor, but let's remember He builds the house. He builds the church. Or else we'll labor in vain that build it. The Lord builds or we labor in vain. The Lord keeps or we watch in vain. And the Lord blesses by giving His children. Let's let the Lord build the house. Amen? For except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the 127th Psalm. Wonderful counsel, wonderful advice that you had David penned his son Solomon about building the temple for you. But it's helped us tonight in building our lives, building our families, building our marriages, building our church. Lord, I pray that we would allow You to build, that You will enable us to labor, but we'll always keep the Lord first and the labor second. And allow You to do that which is pleasing in Your sight in us and through us. Thank You for keeping us, protecting us. Help us to be watchful. Help me as the pastor and the under-shepherd of this church to be on watch for things that would be harmful to our congregation. Help the mothers and fathers, the parents in the building tonight to be watchful over what comes into their home. Help us as individual believers to be watchful what we allow in our life. Help us to look at our children as blessing. Help the younger parents in this room with children at home to, to be able to sharpen them. To point them in the right direction. To realize they're molding and shaping arrows at which will go further and do more than what they've ever been able to do. Thank you for our children that you've given to us in our church. Now, Father, I pray you'll minister to our hearts tonight. Moms, dads, individuals members of Bible Baptist Church, that each of us would, with a bowed head and a sincere heart, would, would confess to you, except the Lord build my house, I labor in vain. Except the Lord keeps me, I watch but in vain. And I pray, Lord, that we would allow you to build our lives for your honor and glory. 